Greetings, Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Bennett Yellen, and he's in town briefly. What, five days? Five, six days, yes. Yeah, yeah. What's your definition of briefly? Oh, if it depends if we're talking about briefs or not. But anyway, to start off, <laughs> say hi to my people. Hello, Wilkinson fans. <laughs> it's Bennett Yellen, and I'm here and looking forward to this. So they may not recognize your name, but they're going to recognize what you've done. So why don't you tell a little about yourself? Just well, start, start anywhere you want. That's boy, that's a big one. But basically, I am a uh, an American born screenwriter uh, who wrote a lot of comedy, and then and then my career sort of changed a bit, and, and I guess I expanded into other genres. But for many years, I did write comedy, and I am the co writer with my writing partners at the time, Peter and Bobby Farrelly, of Dumb and Dumber. And yes, Dumb and Dumber 2, I've worked with them a number of times over the years. They're very good friends. And I think that's the most famous slash infamous thing I've done. And then I've done other things as well in the business, but that's the most well-known. And, and that's probably why I'm here. They're probably why, ask questions. Why did you um, gravitate to comedy? Well, that's a very good question. All your questions will either be answered with a that's a very good question, or you can do better, Wilkinson. Why well, just say it once, and then we'll get it out of the way. <laughs> if, I, I, if I can do better, tell me. I'm funny, and I've always been funny, and so comedy is just... I've always wondered, because I know that there are places where they have classes to teach comedy, mm -hmm. and I can understand how you might be able to teach the sort of the technique of like stand-up, things like that. Right. And even for, to, to write comedy... Even to write it on a screen form or a pilot, there are technical things you could probably teach. But the bottom line is, if you ain't funny inside, you ain't going to be funny outside. I just don't think that you can teach someone who's not funny to be funny. And I was funny. I, I just I had that perspective growing up. I, I always had a skewed perspective on the world and and would see the joke first. You know, I'd look and find the thing that made me laugh, you know, so psychiatrists and therapists out there have at it if you want to figure out why uh, but I was a very happy child as far as I know and what I can remember except for the massive blackout period between <laughs> between like ages 3 and 22 no I, I was a very happy child growing up I had a wonderful childhood I was I was raised Orthodox Jewish I wasn't born Orthodox Jewish but I was raised Orthodox Jewish I have two older sisters we're all very close. I had wonderful, wonderful parents. We had a really beautiful family. And and, and so I just, I'm lucky. I, I, I am so grateful to the universe because I'm so aware of how lucky I am. That is not a given. I, and I, the more yeah. I, I know and the longer I live and the more people I meet, I understand that uh, having a happy childhood is a gift and to have great parents is a gift and to have wonderful siblings. It's just not... Everybody has it, and uh, and I, I was lucky. Hmm. Where did you grow up? What what part of the country? I grew up here in Los. Uh, not here. I'm not here now. I'm, I grew up in Los Angeles. Okay, California. Grew up there and uh, was born in 1959. And so I grew up in California at the height of when California was at its height. You know, the 60s of California with the Beach Boys and and the mid century. It was just. It was the great place to be, and I, so I have such fond memories of yeah. growing up in Los Angeles then. I still remember my dad pulling up into the driveway in his 66 Mustang. Oh, wow. I really? have a vivid visual of it in my head, yeah. What color was it? It was green. It was kind of a weird, metallic -y green. Uh, yeah, that car was... He had it for about... He had the engine rebuilt. He had it for about 300-plus thousand miles wow. before... He finally, I remember the day that they, they took it away and I watched him watch it go. I mean, like my heart broke because I, I know he just loved that car so much, but yeah. Yeah. It's probably worth about 75 grand today, right? Restore, Gosh. restore, oh, at least, at least. Please, I hope not. Because I, I, the, the fact I know, that I let it go to, yeah. I mean, no, it would be. No, I'm sure it would. He had the, he had a, the uh, eight track player in it. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. You kept, you kept the tapes though, right? We let him go. I know, I know. Huh. Wow. I remember how it would click between tracks, like when it was... <laughs> right. With, yeah, yep. they click with the yep. tracks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We've been around too long. Oh, well. 
Are your folks still with us or no? Folks are not not with us anymore. Yeah. Oh, uh, when, when did you lose them? Uh, Dad was 2012. Mom was 2017. I, I I miss them so much. I mean, we were really all very close. And I realized the other day because I also miss my dog. And when my dog passed in 2017, 2019, or, or wait, two years ago, so uh, 21, 21, I, I thought about grief. You don't ever go. I mean, Anyone, listeners, I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> you never get over the grief. You just learn how to accommodate it better, I think. You know, I think about them all the time. And in fact, in fact, I this is a little offshoot, but there's, I don't think there's any, there's any goal we're actually going for. No. I, I'm a person who is very big on the idea of gratitude. Uh, my, my gratitude that I'm alive, that I'm healthy, I'm vertical still because of, of so many things I've done in my life that didn't guarantee that. The fact right. that I can string three words together that maybe make sense, right. you know. Right. And so uh, I, I, since I like gratitude so much, I was thinking, what can I do to add more gratitude to my day? I mean, there must be something. And then I remembered that my Orthodox Jewish father would pray before he ate and after he ate. He always did. I mean, so that's several times a day the man would pray. And I thought, well, Bennett, you know, why don't you come up with a prayer, your own prayer? It doesn't have to be in Hebrew because I never, I went to Hebrew school and I could, I could phonate, I could actually read the Hebrew, but I didn't know what it meant. And when I'd look on the left side of the prayer book and temple or, the translation was so awful, you know, it was all poetic. It was like, the hills skip like rams, you know, I'm like, what does this mean? So I said, why don't you come up with your own prayer in English, you know, and every time you do, you're honoring dad, you're remembering him. So you'd think once I came up with this lovely idea, it would be easy to implement. It took me months, close to a year, Wilkinson, to, Curious, eh? because you me, when I eat, you're just hungry. You go right into eating without stopping, without thinking. And I, I had to stop and learn, stop, pray, think about it, you know. But I love it because several times a day, I, I remember my father by praying and, and he's it, it, the prayer includes a mention of him and it's nice. What was your question? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I'm old. It's memory loss. We're, we're, and we're getting older. <laughs> there you go. Who are you praying to when you do that? My concept of, you know, as a kid, I had a, uh, I had a kind of childlike Ten Commandments idea of this, uh, re this angry God that with a white beard that looks down, yeah. right, with a white beard that looks down and and makes bushes burn and 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 uh, summons locusts and kills firstborn of Egyptians and things like that and hail. Uh, that was my concept of a, a very angry punishing god and and um when i by the way just because we'll, i'm sober i've been sober uh over over 21 years and a big part of sobriety is this this concept of a higher power so right well i couldn't have that the god of the hebrews that i was raised with that was so pun that in my mind was such a punishing god i couldn't have that as my higher power so i had to get rid of it tossed it Went to the mall, went to the, the build, a, build a God shop, workshop at the mall, and came up with my own idea of a, a loving universe, a universal energy that's positive, that's supportive, that's, you know, that's, I, and that's my idea of it. It's, it's just sort of a, what's nice is that I, I really, what I came up with is great because it's, it's, it's ever expansive. It, like, there's no one size fits all, you know, in, right. in my mind. And, uh, and it does really support me spiritually. I, I feel that, and, I, and it's so much so that this sounds like a, like I'm kidding or something. But I, I really feel like I I can end any sentence with blah 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 blah, and the meteor is going to hit. Blah, 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 but I'm but I'm going to be okay. Whatever okay means, you know. Right. Uh, I believe that. I really believe it. Hmm. Do your sisters still live in California? One of them lives in California still. She lives uh, actually out here in Palm Desert. Oh. And she lived in La Quinta for a number of years, about 20, no, not 20 years, but like 15 years. Uh, and then she 
moved just recently to Palm Desert. The other one who was in L.A. all her life, my older sister, Freda. Yes, my older sister's name is Freda. There's a character in Dumb and Dumber named Freda Felcher, uh, and she's named after my sister, who wears that badge of honor. Uh, Did she appreciate that at the time or no? At the time, no one in my family understood quite what it was, and I, I still am astonished that we got away with a character in a PG-13 movie named Freda Felcher. I, I'm, in, in fact, when the movie came out, like, like my cousin would come over and we, we always had people around the table. We, the Yellen house was, everyone was invited and, and the cousin's sitting there and she's talking. She goes, I can't believe you named a character after Freda, Freda Felcher. Freda. And I'm looking around the table. I, I, I'm, I'm turning red because I'm so embarrassed. And I'm looking around the table and I realize nobody knows they're, they don't understand. And, and I'm like, oh, well, heck, if they don't understand, then I don't have to be embarrassed, you know? Right. And so I, I wasn't. But uh, my sister Freda has gotten a lot of play out of, out of, out of her uh, namesake. But she, lives, she lived in L.A. all her life. And then recently her daughter moved to Atlanta. And so, and, and the daughter has two wonderful kids. And she was like, well, I don't want to be a grandmother here in Los Angeles by myself. So she moved to Atlanta and she, she loves to take, she's a really fantastic nature photographer, very gifted. And it's nice that she's in a new place where she can enjoy. She loves living there. They're out in the country. It's, you know, she takes a nature walk around uh, the river every morning and all the photographers know each other. They're like, did you see Beaver X three seven by the? You know, the, I, it's hysterical. Oh, really? Yeah, they all know where what wildlife is there on the right along the water, and they, they talk about it. And I, I love my sisters. I'm, I'm again incredibly lucky to have siblings that are wonderful and supportive, and they're also great people too. Okay. If they're listening, if they're listening, uh, and you can just you can Venmo me, Freda well, you... Freda Marcy, the money. Well, I mean, you told me the truth before we started the podcast, but. That this is good for this anyway. <laughs> good enough. So anyway, let's talk a little about you. You're gay. I, I I've been told that. Yes. Yeah. I would never have guessed that. <laughs> well, other right. than, other than the pink outfit you have head to toe. <laughs> well, look, I, I'm I'm in my leisure my my Palm Springs leisure wear. This is I'm wearing a terry cloth. You don't you can't see it, but I'm wearing a terry cloth shirt with sort of a rainbowy very very 70s, uh, very hip 70s leisure wear. I love terry cloth because how do you, when you wear a towel, don't you feel great when you're wearing a towel? You feel like you're like, you're so comfortable. Well, you wear a terry cloth shirt and it's like being in a towel eye all day. It just feels as good as walking around a towel. When I wear terry cloth, I yeah. feel fat. <laughs> <laughs> you might be allergic to it then. I don't know. Maybe. Now, really, so that's a two-piece? I thought that was a ones that you're wearing. It's not a... <laughs> uh, yeah. we're, we're, people were making all this up, by the way. He, he's not, well, no, he's, the t I, this is a terry cloth shirt. I am telling... I, I do but tell... Not, but you're not wearing pink. No. There's always a kernel of, of truth in my lie, you know? Okay. That, that's uh -huh. that's why that's why they're so believable. Uh -huh. <laughs> so talk about being gay. How was that growing up? When did you figure it out? Well, I, I love the fact that you're assuming I have, but, you know, at, at, at coming up on 64. But uh, I knew, I, 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 here's what I knew as a, as a child. I remember, I'm born in 59, so, you know, I'm, I'm watching television in the 60s, and, uh, and I'm, I'm getting a, like, I, I love Star Trek. I love it because the aliens always managed to rip Captain Kirk's shirt off Right, like at chest level, just there'd be a, a, a rip, and there's his chest would be shining through, and I'd be like, I like that, you know, like like you know, we would watch the King and I, and you know, Yul Brenner's wearing these pajama pants for half the movie. I liked that, you know, and but I didn't know what to do with it. I, I liked the Captain and the Captain and or, or, or uh, the Ghost of Mrs. Muir, Edward Mulhair. I thought he's so handsome, you know. And, there was an attraction and it wasn't sexual. I'm a kid, so I wouldn't say it was sexual, but it was, I was attracted to them. Well, what am I going to do? Say I, I go to school and at recess, what are the kids talking about? Uh, Raquel Welch in 10,000 years BC, you know, no one's saying they thought Captain Kirk was good looking. And, and so I'm like, 
well, this is a secret. This is wrong. This is something God's going to punish me for. Yeah. So you came up with that on your own. I came up with that all on my on my own. Yeah, that mm. which part the, that that it's that I that can't it's wrong. Yeah. Yes, right. Wow. There, well, we're talking about the '60s. I mean, when the 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 people that I felt closest to were the ones who like Charles Nelson. Riley. I'd see Charles Nelson Riley on TV. I'd see Paul Lynn on TV. I'd say, "That's who I'm like." I, even Tony Randall, who I still haven't figured out Tony Randall yet because. He had kids. He had a kid when he was like eighty, you know. Uh, but him, as we know, gay men do have children. It happens. They do. They do. I don't know. It happens. Yeah. Wow. wow. You're right. I have three sons. There you see, Fred McMurray. <laughs> huh. Uh, but it's interesting that you, without any feedback, you came up with this is wrong. Just because you were different, you were wrong. Different, wrong, and already I felt different because I was Orthodox Jew. I was the only Orthodox Jewish person in school. I'd bring a kosher lunch. You know, I, I couldn't eat in the cafeteria. I'd have to bring a kosher lunch and separate, different. But that part felt, no, I didn't hear any other boys in recess talking about the feelings that I had like that. So uh, that my default was, there must be something wrong with that. Yeah. Uh. For for many years, I felt like that. And, 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 I uh, I had I created a face, a smiling Bennett mask that did not communicate the confusion that was going on behind it. It just it just it, you'd think everything was fine. Now here it is. It came in very handy in my life, but it wasn't authentic. So in the younger years, you knew you were attracted, but so then when did that change to hmm, I'm I'm gay? How old were you when you said that to yourself, or did you? Well, no, it, it took year. I mean, it took years for me to actually say that, and probably it wasn't until I was. Boy, I, I, we're, we're going out of teens. I mean, like, like I, I, I lived at home until I, I lived at home and I went to grad. I went to undergrad at UCLA while I was living at home, and then graduated and uh, decided to go on and get a, a an MFA, Master's of Fine Arts, and I, I thought. I will teach uh, creative writing and I'll get a pipe and uh, a corduroy coat with uh, patches on the elbows. Those like leather. Yeah. The elbows thing. Right. Yeah. And I'll go teach in the Midwest. I'll teach writing in the Midwest. That was my... So I went and got an MFA in fiction at University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And I purposely wanted to leave California because it was time to leave the nest. I wanted to see what it was like. And it, that's when I was really... Exp it, it, really experimenting with my sexuality. And I don't mean with, with women. I, I dated a few women. That wasn't until I got back from at when that degree was done and I came back to Cal Los Angeles. But that's when I really explored uh, gay life, gay sexuality and things like that. I did a little bit of that just before I graduated UCLA. But at that point, I'm thinking, well, there's no, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's a question here, you know. But yeah, it was, it all was, I, nothing came comfortably and sat comfortably with me. I was always sort of fighting it. You know, I'm the only male in an Orthodox Jewish family. There's the pressure of the name Yellen, uh, and continually, uh, I felt all that. You know, and uh, and I, I I wasn't out to any of my I wasn't out to my family. I wasn't out to any friends. None of my. Was friends. there a point that you came out to him? Oh yeah, yeah. And I, what I did was. <laughs> uh, sometimes my lizard brain gets gets too much control of me. Uh -oh. uh, I didn't come out to them until I came to them with a whole pile of of woes, and and that was just stuck amongst them. I I, I came out to them after the guy that I had been dating bankrupted me, and and all that, and I said like, okay, I'm a dad, I'm. I'm bankrupt and I'm gay because I, like I just threw it in there with a whole bunch of stuff so that maybe they would like, it would seem less of the uh, but that was not I, mean, I think I was 23 it took a, when I finally hit them with that how do they respond I remember they're orthodox Jewish right but uh, I, my mom said well don't expect me to this was God, 1992 or whatever. don't don't expect me to open up some champagne <laughs> with what she said my mom was very dry really uh, yeah but she said the only thing I would ask of you is to not tell uh, 
my father's parents were, were no longer alive, but she, her parents still were. She said, just, just don't tell uh, grandma, Bubby and Zadie, you know, it's just orthodox, grandma and grandpa. And I said, if, that, if that's what you want, it's fine. Yeah. And I never did. And I don't know if they ever knew what I mm. think about it now. Yeah. How would your uh, sisters react? Sisters were fine. And then, and then from that point on, they, they, everybody was also supportive, you know, very supportive of me and, and very, you know, very cautious of me. I think my mom's, um, my mom's concern about it was, it wasn't a religious concern. It was more of, I just, I just want you to be with somebody in your life. You know, that was her concern. You know, and she didn't want you to be alone. She didn't want me to be alone. Yeah. Right. And, and that was at the end of her life. That was a big, she actually made a friend of mine. She said, I, I, I want you to please help Bennett not be alone. I like, I, I, like arrange something for you or to be with but or, or oh no not not for <laughs> not for him to be with me per se but to, yeah. to 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 try and help me get there you know if if it happens so and you've had partners i have had partners yeah how'd that go from worse to better <laughs> is it better because you're not with any of them now or what no it's better because i got better i, I learned so much in between them all i i there was so much fumbling and confusion and, and so many wrong moves and so much, yeah, so many things that I, I wanted, to, that I would want to change that I did try and change. And I think what I do, I do my best evolving when I'm single, but then I'm evolved and ready to take it into another, you know. I also don't, I've spent so much of my life alone that I don't really feel a powerful urge to be with somebody. Although I, I love being with somebody. I like relationships and I, I'm ready for the next one. Should it manifest? I, I honestly mm. believe that I think it will, you know, I, even though as I get older, it gets hard. It's harder to meet somebody. Also, I, as, as I get older, I'll speak for me as I get older, I, I'm like, I'm very aware of the time I have left and I don't want to waste time on something that's not work. Like I don't put up with things that when I'm younger, younger, right. I'm like, Oh, well, I don't know whether this is working or not, but I don't know if I want to end it on it. No, I'll give yeah. it a try. Yeah. Right. No, I don't feel that way. Now it's like, like I'm looking for things I want in somebody. And if, you know, I, I'm trying to be open, but if I don't see it, I, I'm, I'm moving on to the next, that sort of thing. I just don't, I don't waste time. Like I did. It's, it's a much more valuable commodity to me now. And, and if it happens, it happens. What I felt, my philosophy about that is because I've, I've, I have, you know, I'm, I'm on like apps like Tinder and, and Hinge. And, and, uh, my philosophy is why don't I just do what I like to do? And in the course of doing it, I may find somebody else who's doing what they like to do. Right. And that's the way, that's the most organic way to, to meet somebody than to try and make it happen. I, you know those people. I have friends, and I'm sure you do too. They can't be alone. I mean, I don't have a judgment about that, but they can't. And they're out. They're in a relationship, and then they're out of one, and then they're right back in another one, right immediately because it's tough. And, and for me, being a, being alone is the, is a chance to grow. You know. Hmm. Now I've never done this before, but you know I have podcast notes. So if you want to put your list of what you might be looking for, we can include that if you'd like. <laughs> I'm going to leave it. You know, I lean heavily on the universe. I'm going to leave it to the universe. What else do you want to talk about? What you want to talk about? Well, we haven't talked about your career, but everybody talks about that. What were you, was there anything that you were afraid I was going to ask you? No. No, because I like, like, why, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, and again, if you ask me something that I can't imagine what, here, let's try it. Let's try it. Th think of a question that you would, might think I'd be afraid to answer, and we'll see. I mean, you know. Well, I suppose we should talk a little about your career. We don't have to. Everybody does that. Well, we don't have to. We so, I no, I have, I have some questions. So what is, do, do you have a favorite movie that you've written the screenplay for? I do, but it's going to surprise you because it didn't get made, which, oh. which shouldn't be surprising. Um, well, maybe there'll be a producer listening. Or something. Well, this one can't because of the rights, but basically... Oh. We were, Warner Brothers at one point was going to produce uh, a film version of the Beverly Hillbillies, and Peter Farrelly and Bobby Farrelly and I went in to meet on that, and we got the job, and we wrote this script that was terrific. It was 
really, we were just in the zone on it. And I, I mean, I, I love Dumb and Dumber and, and the, the movie is what we wrote. It, it, it is exactly what we wrote. But this script for the Beverly Hillbillies was hysterical. And then it didn't get produced. And, and what typically happens is it goes into turnaround, you know, and, and a project like that where there's rights and everything like that, it's a little more complicated. But ultimately it went to turnaround and it went, the rights went to 20th Century Fox. Fox developed a whole nother script uh, with two other writers and they made the movie with this uh it was actually the cast was pretty good it was jim uh jim varney who was uh what's his name hey Vern, uh ernest jim okay. varney was was uh was the head of the family and it, it was a really good cast so was it called beverly it was called the beverly hillbillies okay, yeah so it got just it got made and it wasn't very good and what peter fairley heard years later was that the director of it penelope spheris is a good director she was halfway through shooting the movie and someone slipped her our script of the Beverly Hillbillies. She read it. She closed it at the end of act one. And she said, I didn't even, I, I was so depressed. I didn't even want to continue. Really? Yeah. And that's a lovely compliment in a weird, in a, in a skewed way. But that script was just terrific. We, we had such a funny introduction of, how they get the money because you think that it's just you think it the oil money it's yeah. the oil but our, right. we had a whole different take on it that was genius and so yeah. I've always been thrilled about that and by the way we we were talking about before we actually had a conversation before this started people listening um, talking about things in storage in my storage locker somewhere in the back of my storage unit is that script because when we wrote it it was you know. It's not digitized. It's, it was, not paper. it's not on paper. It is on paper in the back of it. Only one that one copy is somewhere there in the back. Wow! I'd like to get in there and get that get that screenplay because it was such a damn good screenplay. You couldn't like just switch it to something else and use basically the same idea. No, it's so it's so them and it plays so off of them. Okay, you know because that that was it. We nailed those characters. You know, that's too bad. I know, but I've written a lot of projects, a lot of, you know, 32, I started in 86 and, and, and pretty much kind of kind of retired in 2019 or 2018. So that's a lot of years of, right. of being a, although I, I'm not retired in that um, my writing partner, my last writing partner, who James Johnston, who we wrote together for 14 years, we wrote a uh, a supernatural thriller back in, I think like 2017, maybe. Uh, it was a feature. Uh, and uh, just before the strike, the writer's strike, a producer want, it took us out. He w became interested in it about six months before. That's always exciting because it, it's a script you've already written. It's a spec right. script, meaning it's speculative. There's right. no, no rights to it whatsoever. And he came in, he was interested and the Friday before the strike started, he took us to breakfast and he said, guys, is the strike really happening? And we said, yeah, from all we can tell and, and from the guild, you know, the meetings we've had, yeah. And he said, well, I want to buy, well, there was literally three days before, it. he said, I want to buy traction. And we're like, okay, great, we're thrilled. So we had to do some fast running around to make sure the contracts were cool and all that before the strike started. And we did, we sold this script three days before, uh, down to the wire when the strike started. And then, of course, as a result of the strike, we can't work on it. So the we sold it because of the strike, and we can't work on it because of the strike. And that's the... the, the so how does that work? So he's doing some preliminary stuff himself on it in the meantime? Well, he owns it. Yeah, right. he, he can do whatever he wants to it. Right? So will he bring you back in later? Is that part of the deal? or that the, the, it, it, it kind of was, but... He really can't do what he wants, and, and he can't. While the strike is on, we can't work on it. So, no. Well, and you can't even sell a script during the strike. No, you can't. You can't. You can't work it in, in any capacity with material. You can't. It's it's the pencils down is what they is the, the term for it. Wow, it's a kind of a tangent. But where's the strike stuff at right now? It's nowhere. The last word that we got, basically, the bottom line is that producers and the studios. Where they're willing to bend are the things that aren't are, are the least important to us, you know. What a shock. So and the stuff that we're we're adamant about are the, are the things that they're 
adamant about not bending on. So I think we're apart. I don't. You know, at one point, maybe uh, three weeks ago, we heard rumblings that it might be settled by Labor Day. You know, well now I think it won't be settled before the end of the year, which wow. is yeah, which is really. I know it's a dismal thought, but so from a writer's standpoint, what's the, what are the main beefs? I'm the by the way, preface. I think I'm the worst spokesperson, <laughs> absolute worst spokesperson yeah. for this. But there's several things that stand out on this one. One is that, and this happens every probably around every 15 years or so. New technologies. I can't remember what the what the music that music app was like 15 years ago where all they had to reconceive how you pay the artists because it, there was a word for it, it was like uh, not spotify because spotify is new but there was a new app or a new way of streaming music right. basically 15 years ago and, and so they had to reconceive how they're going to pay the artists and everything like that that's streaming now when we when we agreed to certain things on the last strike with 2007 2008 streaming was just starting and uh we didn't really understand it and now it's become the central way the, the way that money comes to the studios and so and they're also so uh, they're so unforthcoming and i don't know if that's a word <laughs> about how much they make uh which is an enormous amount and and we need to know what they make so that we know what we could make for how they're going to compensate us so that has to be worked out, reconceived uh, streaming. To, AI is a big, a big. We're on the forefront of doing that now because we're one of the, one of the businesses that are just talking about it now. But every business, almost every business, is going to have an impact where a, with AI. But I'll give you an example of what what it means to a writer. The first draft of any project, whether it's film, television is the most important. The first draft is your blueprint. And it's got, that's that's why structural, in a contract, that's why the writer always gets paid the most for a first draft, because it's that important. And then you make, rewrite, you rechange it from that first draft, but just that it's, that's why it's respected. And what they want to do is they want to have AI generate a first draft and then bring the writer in for, ah, we can pay you. You can tweak it. Tweak it. Yeah. They get pay you a lot less and tweak it. And that's not kosher, you know. Uh and it and it won't work like that. I call it instead of artificial intelligence, I, I I call it artificial regurgitation because really it just takes the information right. and it only it, knows it, what it Right. And shakes already. it up right. and then spits it out again. And things that are missing is the human things, you know, uh which affect it. It's a big thing, you know. Even in, like in Dumb and Dumber, some a lot of the jokes in Dumb and Dumber came from experiences that we had. You know, Bobby Fairley had a, a date where they they and they came into her place and, and it, she went upstairs and he had to go to the bathroom really badly, <laughs> like his his bowels were going to explode, and so he ran to the the nearest toilet and and heard her upstairs going, "Oh, don't use the downstairs bathroom, toilet's broken." Too yep. late, right? Too late, and uh, that's <laughs> uh, that didn't happen to AI. That's not gonna, so, that scene was so funny. That's not going to happen to AI. By the way, that scene, the first cut of Dumb was long. I mean, that's the first cuts are always long. It was like two hours, 40 minutes, whatever. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, yeah, long, like a lot of extra stuff. And <laughs> Jeff Daniels' manager was sitting next to me, and the bathroom scene went on for two minutes at least, at least with the, like extra stuff like he's he takes the rests the toilet uh and, and is dumping it out the window i mean yeah all that and i remember he turned to me and his his, his face was absolutely ashen he said you're cutting all this aren't you and i said oh absolutely <laughs> <laughs> maybe not all of them. oh maybe not all wow so they really want to do the first draft. Huh? I know that the actors are all bitching about the. Uh... Well, think if you're a voice actor, yeah. uh, you're you're gone. Yeah. It, it, in in two minutes, your 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 voice is recorded, and then integrated, they, they use it, and, and you're then... gone. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it, it's for actors, and also they were they're getting more sophisticated. It's all the sophistication and the improvement of AI is exponential. 
It's going to be. So even what what's, seems clunky now in terms of the writing it produces, it's going to get to a point where it's, you cannot tell. Fast, probably. And there's got to be there's got to be some rules about it. I just have to. Did you see the new uh, Harrison Ford movie? Which one? The, uh, the, the Indiana Jones? Yeah. 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 That was, I mean, we were all sitting there wondering, how did they do this? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, like the, the, the young, that made him young. When he was younger. Yeah. 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 That was, it was crazy. Cause and I, they did I, it. I, I don't watch. That was the first one of those. I hate to say that I've ever seen. That was the first. You, you, yeah. The last one was the first one yeah, for the, you. Yeah. And my friends, of course, go to one wall and they, they were saying, you know, they're the ones that were puzzled more because it's right. like. They remember they, him they from did, the first yeah, one. They didn't take that from any other right. movie. It wasn't, right. like, it wasn't a, like extra footage from, yeah, from number one. In. It was no, real it was new like, stuff. Like there he is. It, it's, yeah, it's, it, it will be, I, my concern about it is the election because it, it's becoming easier and easier to create material where it looks like someone's saying something and uh and you can create material where they didn't say it and well i exactly i saw actually a clip it was a politician talking to a group and he showed a video and he said that's not me i did not say that yeah I didn't say any of that imagine that and and this is going to shock you will on the internet so it must be true there are people there are people out there who before this technology believed what they saw <laughs> and heard, you know, uh, and it's scary that it's just going to be, I won't know who's telling the truth. There, you know, there was a point, children gather round. <laughs> there was a point in in time right. where there was something called the truth and there was something that was the untruth and, and it, they were distinct and you knew the difference and right. it's all blur now. It's scary to me. That's a whole other, let let's talk about happy things. <laughs> well, are all of the politicians really still alive? <laughs> There's another one. Oh, I would love to find out no. <laughs> I would be thrilled. That would be a holiday for me. There you go. <laughs> huh. Anything else pressing that you want to talk about? Pressing? No, what's pressing? You know, I'm 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 trying to figure out what to do. I mean, I'm, like this is the big uh, existential question. What do you do? But I'm retired. I'm retired now. And could, wait, could you? Do you cook? I don't cook. I, I eat. I do the I, I do the other side of cooking. I eat. You could learn to cook and open a French bakery. I could learn to cook and put on seven hundred pounds, which you know, cooking for one, that's probably what would happen. And that's that is my fear that uh, I would take it up as a hobby and because I have some friends who love to cook and they're really fantastic cooks and I love to be the recipient but uh, if I were to do it myself and bake I love cooking I like everything that's going to make me fat uh, and I did I had I used to weigh almost 200 pounds you can't see me now but audience but I am a fetching like 144 and I was 197 at one point how did you do that uh, how did I get to 197 and how did oh, I get to 144? <laughs> uh, we all know how you got up there. How'd, yes. How did you get down? Um, at the time, Atkins, the Atkins diet was very popular. And my doctor said, why don't you try it? But here's my suggestion. Try it for a month and don't think of it as a diet. When you think of, of something, you're on a diet. You think it's like a race you're running and you're going to hit your goal and you're going to stop. You know, you know, and Don't look at it like that. Look at it as like a lifestyle change. See how do you feel with eating the things you're eating, right. and and that was eye opening because because I I realized that I was probably a carb addict. I don't know, I not was I probably am still. I I love I eat the carbs. I get the high. I get the drop. You know, just like a drug. Mm. And so I, I liked it. I liked eating healthier foods, uh, low carbs, and things like that. Back then, it was really it was harder to find. We're talking 2002, 2000. Harder to find decent low carb foods. They were all low carb board. Right. <laughs> Our board. Well, I was going to say, yeah. That really was what it tasted like. There was Atkins was one of the few companies making them. So there, there's so many. So that it's basically a low carb, higher fat, higher protein. Yeah, because the, the things that like bacon is low carb and, and, and butter and, uh, and, the, and so those things. And you think that's crazy that you could eat that stuff 
and lose weight, but you can. And and I also, I think I the first 10 pounds or 20 pounds, I, I went to Weight Watchers, which was hilarious because you go in and, and you have to come in like once a week to weigh yourself, you know, and the women would be taking off their jewelry. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, yeah. Like that's going to add a few pounds. <laughs> well, I remember my ex-wife was on that. We lived in a cul-de-sac at the time. And uh, so she'd pay every week and she wasn't really losing any weight. And I go, okay, why don't we do this? I'll take the scale out into the cul-de-sac and you can get on it. It'll have a mega, you know, I'll just announce to the neighborhood what you what you weigh <laughs> yeah, the shame every diet. week. Yes. And that way we'll save some bucks. She, right. She didn't go for it. No, no. But it's an idea to try the shame diet. I like it. Yeah. No. So that uh, I realized I really liked, I liked the way I felt, and then and then and then once once you keep it off, and and you know, and once you get it off, and once you get your for me, I'll speak for me, get my body back into shape and everything like that, and I'm I'm you you're like I, I will not go back. That you're you're adamant about it. I don't w- want to return to that. So you become very I'm very proactive about it, and now I do, and I really like it. I do this um, intermittent fasting. I knew you were going to say that. yeah. Yeah, I should have left. I should have like left a blank and let you fill it in. That works for me. And what a lot of a lot of losing weight requires rewiring your brain. The way you think about food, the way you eat food. That's that's a big element of it that you don't. That that's not. It's not uh, addressed by just exercise and diet. And um, and I've noticed that, like even with intermittent fasting, I don't. I, so I do the eight hour, eight hour window of eating, and then you don't eat outside that eight hour window. So sixteen hours you don't eat, and eight hours. So what? Are, what are your cutoffs? Is it like seven at night? I, and it all depends on what my what my first yeah. meal is. So I usually don't have breakfast, so I I won't have a first meal till eleven thirty or twelve, and then my last meal has to be done by eight or seven thirty or eight. Easy to do, right? But I've had friends say I just can't do that. I can't change my the way my brain thinks to eat that way. I, I've got to have, I, you know, I wake up in the morning, I got to have my, my coffee and my bagel and my, or my croissant or whatever. I've got to have it. And that's where the change comes is, is you have to just rewire your brain about the way you do things. But I like it. And it's, and I, well, I kind of eat what I want to be quite honest. I don't, yeah. I, you know, I, but I'm also, I try to be thoughtful like i'm not eating pizza for every meal and ice cream in between and things and then stopping at eight o'clock and going oh i got this no well my three favorite food groups are crusty bread yes oh delicious potatoes yes delicious ice cream delicious yeah (laughs) and probably there's an actually crusty bread potato ice cream from ben and jerry's that that just hits the yuck (laughs) wow so you kind of watch the low carb thing but not I watch, I I watch it, but, but I only have, I'm only eating two meals a day and I will have a snack. I mean, uh, uh, so I'll have a sandwich. I mean, that's bread, but, and and I'll have, but I'm just not egregious about eating every fat thing and thinking that, you know, it's, I get away with it. Cool. All right. So when we wrap it up, okay. I usually ask this question. What have you learned in your life that you'd like as a main thing that you go by? Besides the diet stuff. Besides the diet stuff. Yeah. yeah. What what could you pass on to my people here? I've got a good one. I got a good one. What? And this is good. This is probably because I, as I'm sober, I learned this in sobriety. The first uh, the fir- of the 12 steps, first step is step one, uh, we're powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. And this is what I've learned and I love it. I have learned when in my life I am powerless because I'm, I, I am always trying to, to steer the car, right? Right. I've learned when I'm powerless and when I am, I could take my hands off the wheel. Now, I, I can do that because also because I feel like I have a sense of a higher power, you know, it's a spiritual program. But to know, to recognize, oh, I don't have to keep, I'm struggling and I don't have to. I'm stressing and I don't have to. I can let go, let go and let it happen, whatever it is. And and I'll, and I'll be fine because I'll, I'm always going to be fine. And even, even in a negative, I'm, 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 I'm fine. Like I learned something and, and, and perfect example is that I, you know, I used to, to 
take substances to numb myself to feelings. But now I have a full range of emotions and feelings. And even if it's something sad, if it's a parent dying, if it's a, it's a, a beloved pet dying, the feelings are the greatest show of love I could possibly have for that parent or for that dog. If I didn't feel it, if I was numb to it, and so, so to have that rainbow of colors, is a, it's a beautiful thing, even if it's a negative thing. I, it makes me very aware that I'm alive. It makes me aware of loss. It makes it just makes my life more aware. Um, so, but 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 the thing I like is is the the whole power. When I'm powerless, I recognize it more. Sometimes it takes me a while, and I'm like, why am I stressing? Mean, oh shoot, I'm stressing because. I think I can control this, but I can't control it, you know. And there's a lot of things that I can control in life too. I mean, but so it's not like I'm powerless over everything. Right. Right. But uh, there's so much that I am powerless over, and when I know it, I just let go and go, okay, go. and less stress, happy Bennett, happier Bennett. Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> I knew you'd be a fun guy. Oh, what am I? Okay, I want to know where would you rank me, <laughs> and and. Listeners, please send send Wilkinson your your ranking. I'm sure you're in the like at least the top eighty percent. Oh my gosh, great! <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No, this was great because you didn't. Uh, many of these podcasts will focus only on on Dumb and Dumber and my career, and this was right. this was way more free ranging. And you know, I like to. I, you're a fun guy, and I wanted to hear your story. Oh, I, I don't know how you knew it was going to be interesting, and you may still not know, but no, uh, good. But I had a good time. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Sure. <laughs>